Now it's recording. So, all right. Well, welcome everyone. Thanks for thanks for taking the time and joining tonight. Um, so, this is the, our virtual happy hour after AU 2020. Um, and today, we're just going to have a recap discussion uh, about the keynotes that have gone on throughout the day here. Um, and just a couple of points of housekeeping. Um, so, like I said, we're just going to have a quick panel discussion, maybe not a quick panel discussion, because I do feel like we're going to go down some rabbit holes um, based off of some of the technology that was talked about here today. Um, but if there are any questions throughout the discussion, feel free to drop those into the, the question and answer panel here in Zoom. Um, and of course, we'll be recording this webinar as well as I just started it, and uh, we'll be distributing that out um, to everyone as well. Um, and so my name is Ian McGaw. I'll be your moderator tonight. Um, I'm the uh, Vice President of Global Technology and Innovation here at EMG. Um, so been working with a lot of different technologies over the years, um, but really focused on owners these days um, and how they're digesting and utilizing <clears throat> me, data. Um, so we've got a couple of different panelists with us. Um, so our first panelist is Giselle Howe. Um, Giselle, why don't you uh, let us know a little bit about yourself? Certainly. Well, good evening, everyone. Thanks for coming here. So I'll tell you a little bit about me. So uh, the majority of my 10 years in this field uh, has been spent in the gaps or the crossroads of multiple uh, environments. Now, what does that mean? That means that prior to coming here, I worked for a building product manufacturer, and I worked in the design department of that building product manufacturer. So when the manufacturer would launch new products, I'd be running alongside to get all of the uh, CAD and BIM libraries also uh, updated or, or launched as well. And that went for Autodesk products, non-Autodesk products, multiple platforms across the board. Along with that, a little bit of software support, software deployment, a little bit of marketing. Uh, I had to build a lot of relationships along the way. And if you're wondering like what kind of role encompass all of that, I'm happy to say I'm a recovering CAD manager and I'm so happy to be here tonight. So back to you, Ian. <laughs> Thank you, <laughs> well, that's great. Um, we've also, we're joined here with uh, Jim Masica, uh, or Masaki as, as well. Um, and, and he's our VP of Global BIM Content. And um, he was kind of a last minute add to, to the panelists because um, you know, a lot of what was discussed today really seems to be content centric. Um, so Jim, why don't, why don't you tell a little bit about yourself? Sure. Uh, I've been uh, working with the ENG Works now for more than a decade, 11 years in fact. Uh, and I started, uh, uh, I'm, but I've been in the AEC industry for about 30 years. So I am uh, consider myself uh, uh, not a recovering CAD manager, but a recovering architect. So, um, and now have been, but I've been involved in MEP for, for a long time, much of my career. So I, I, when I got started in this, it was, uh, I, I was very interested in Revit as the sort of the next technology uh, and having been working with it for a number of years, uh, can no longer uh, consider going back to AutoCAD. So um, just, uh, I love it. I love knowing, uh, learning about new, new technologies and, and new techniques, not only in uh, producing quality content, but in how uh, the components are actually speaking to each other's in, in, uh, each other inside of uh, projects. So that's kind of my forte here. Uh, I don't have anything else prepared. <laughs> I like you can say I'm a last minute ad, so but uh, I'll be happy to participate. Yeah, absolutely. Thanks, Jim. Um, and we're also joined with Thomas Love Zigo from Clayco. Um, Thomas Love, why don't you tell us a little about yourself? <laughs> well, thank you. Thank you, Ian, for having me, and, and thanks, Ian. It's, it's 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 really nice to see a group of like-minded individuals. And and first, I'll, I'll say I'm I'm here to really listen to all of you about what you experienced during this first virtual AU because I really paid no attention. I was way too busy, and I apologize. But I'll be able to, to talk about it probably. So what do I do? Um, um, at at Clayco as a CTO of a large national design builder, I'm really trying to make sense of how to weave all the technology at, at, with, with multiple facets of our engagement, from a design end to construction end, to handover, working and collaborating with consultants like you, directly working with, with behemoths like Autodesk, um, 
and across the range of projects. And if I need to describe my role internally, it's more of a, using all the experience that you know, I'm almost there, almost 30 years, not quite there, but I'm getting almost 30 years of experience in AC space. Again, as a recovering architect, uh, how to how to really strategize and and pick the right path and and filter out the noise and and purposefully spend company money on things that will keep us being competitive. And also, what does it mean to trans transform um, a construction company um, or, or implement the full gamut of uh, digital transformation a construction company kind of align it with some advancements that are happening in industrialized part of human activity. So it's, it's challenging, it's interesting. Sometimes we bang our hands, you know, hands against the wall, but, you know, we, we may probably like that paint. So that's what I do. That's right. We are going and, to yeah, Thank you for having us here. Of course, of course. No problem. Thank you for the cookies. Yeah, <laughs> good cookies, of course. Um, and, and we're also joined um, on, the, on the web with uh, John uh, from GAPCON. Uh, John, could you share a few more questions? Yeah, absolutely. Thank you, Ian, and thank you, uh, Nalita, for uh, moderating tonight's happy hour. I'm really excited to be here. Um, yeah, I'm uh, I'm John Niles. Uh, I'm a senior project integrator for GAFCON. Um, as some of you know or or may not know, uh, I'm really passionate about technology and and how it can be used to improve our day to day lives as well as what we can do in the construction industry. How can we make it safer? How can we make it more efficient and how can we break down those silos that exist between, you know, the architects, the engineers, uh, the contractors and the owners. And, and really, I'm excited about um, talking about some of those things that I'm seeing today. Um, that's why I'm with GAFCON. I bring 30 years of experience in the AECO um, uh, to GAFCON uh, and hope to help their game changing clients. A little bit about GAFCON, uh, you may not know. GAFCON is based out of San Diego. It has four offices and uh, projects worldwide. We're ranked uh, number 32 in ENR 2019, um, is uh, one of the top professional services. We've collected over 150 awards for projects delivered in the past 10 years. So again, I'm really excited to be part of this panel discussion um, and to participate, although uh, not not um, be at Autodesk University this year. I'm happy to, uh, to be able to participate and learn from uh, some really uh, world-class leaders. So back to you, Ian. Thanks, John. Yeah, awesome. And uh, last but not least, we're joined by Rich Conyers uh, from Fox Architects. And Rich, can you share a little bit about yourself? Absolutely, thanks, Ian. Um, so as, as Ian said, I'm Rich Conyers with Fox Architects. I'm a registered architect, I actually started uh, in the residential construction industry before I became an architect. Um, so I'm a recovering uh, carpenter as opposed to a recovering <laughs> architect like some of the others on this call. Um, came through kind of a BIM channel, uh, learning more about specify or excuse me, specifically on uh, visualization practices and um, changing some of our workflows with our company on the BIM and visualization side. But um, also kind of introducing that from a project manager side and how we create more efficient workflows and learn from and hopefully teach Autodesk once in a while how to make our lives a little bit easier. That's right, that's a great point, Rich. Yeah, absolutely. Um, okay, so we're really excited to jump into the discussion here about the keynotes today. Um, but before we do that, um, what I'd like to do is, is just kind of talk a little bit about um, what, what all we have. This is a happy hour. Um, and so um, we on this side here, um, we've actually got two options. We've got a wonderful rum um, that drinks like a scotch, and I'm a scotch drinker, I love it, um, that, that one of our, our wonderful people, Nalita, who's on the call here, uh, has brought back for us, um, very smooth. Um, the other one I will let Jim introduce, and he has visited this distillery um, and has, has provided this bottle for us. Yeah, that's a, it's, a, it's an Ab Aberlour 12 year. It's a it's a it's a single malt uh, scotch. I had the a benefit, the privilege, in fact, of visiting uh, 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 Dufton. Uh, Aberlour is now actually in Dufton, but uh, the uh, Dufton is where m many of the major distilleries are in in Scotland. So uh, the the owner Chris and I had a 
uh, I think it was like a seven mile walking tour where we basically drank scotch every 200 yards. So it was fantastic. Uh, and uh, that, sounds like a great time. Yeah, it was a good time. Yeah. So it's a it's a very it's a it's a very smooth scotch. It's a it's a it's a anthracite coal fired uh, or dried grain. It's not peaty. It's just a, it's a smooth scotch, and it's a it's a quality one that I've learned about. It does absolutely. 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 Yeah. yeah. Uh, what what else do you guys have? So I definitely didn't go uh, to, to break the bank tonight or anything extremely special. Um, I've got the Elijah Craig bottle that, uh, if you can't tell, is running a little dry already um, because it got open last night instead of tonight. But uh, just one of the um, standbys I usually keep on hand around the house. Absolutely. Uh, that's a great one, too, with uh, Angel's, uh, Angel's Envy yep. as well. So, and just like how you were holding up your, your glass of wine there. Yeah, um, I don't have a lot of facts about mine other than it said it's yellow and it's Moscato and it's very sweet. So that's all I got. <laughs> awesome. awesome. John, do you have anything to do? And, you know, uh, I'm keeping in uh, AU happy hour tradition. I'm drinking uh, a yeah. nice warm Stella. Um, <laughs> awesome. Oh, that's great. <laughs> you know. well, well, cheers, everyone. Yeah, cheers. 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 All right. Yeah. <laughs> so, um, let's start with the general session. Um, you know, there was a lot that was said in the general session, a lot of things that, that were broken down, and, and I'm going to reference my notes here a little bit. Um, of course, um, you know, a, a great deal, um, and it did kind of start off with, with COVID and some of the changes that we've had to make um, agility-wise. And what I wanted to ask everybody really was, you know, you know we all had to make changes. Uh, back in March, um, some earlier, some later. But um, you know, from from a company perspective, how how did the changes that you all had to make uh, kind of align with what Autodesk was talking about here this morning? You know, um, did you did you see, for instance, um, the acceleration of technology being implemented, um, and and or did you see more barriers to those things? So um, okay. I'll, I'll give a for instance, uh, as a company that was an early adopter of Revit, but not necessarily an early adopter of cloud and some of the um, implementations from uh, e even before BIM 360, when, when A360 started, let alone Revit server, um, it, it was interesting to see um, the push that we were already moving towards BIM 360 and live collaboration and how that was fueled by remote work and how um, it was already on our to-do list and became a to-do list for the next 18 months or so to overnight um, just due to the amount of remote work that was happening. Um, we did have remote server access, but there were bottlenecks that started to be created when everyone was at home. So um, starting, with, uh, starting with anticipations of things that would be implemented and uh, how those got changed to they need to be implemented right now was definitely a cause from 2020. For sure. Uh, to add to that, um, I'd say that since I was on the software support side for quite a while, um, in March, we had to embrace a lot of technology right away. Um, and that went outside of Autodesk as well. So we had a lot of um, the single user licenses and there were some multi-user ones, but the thing is those had to tie to the server, but it was a challenge in trying to connect to that server at times because uh, you know, people with internet connections, VPN had had an issue, that sort of thing. So we had to, we really pushed for the single user uh, licenses of Autodesk. Um, that was a thing that was supposed to uh, take place in uh, when our stuff was renewing. Um, it looks like Autodesk actually now lets people have multi-user licenses beyond this point now. But for us, um, or my previous place that I worked, um, that was something we really wanted to push for. Just having everyone have their single user license, they didn't really have to worry about trying to connect to a server, that sort of thing. Um, otherwise, in terms of other technology, we had to embrace things like Microsoft Teams, um, a lot of the video conferencing, that sort of thing, um, as I suppose a lot of firms did. But um, that was something we really had to embrace back in March. So 
Um, yeah, from the software support side, um, you tend to react to that change. Um, you see it on the front lines, essentially. So I saw that quite a bit uh, back in March. And I would, say, you know, I would say just to add on to what Giselle was saying and Rich, you know, 2020 has been rough, and and I think, I think plans for remote work were were sort of in in you know in their stages. Um, but COVID really just accelerated that and made it happen. And I think we've had to reimagine, you know, everything that was, was, you know, no longer possible. And, and how are we going to juggle all of our work with, um, you know, uh, taking care of kids and getting them to school and, and you know, you know, the, the dogs barking in, 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 on Zoom calls and, and everything else. This has really been kind of a, a tough year, but um, you know, Autodesk has helped us adapt to that um, and being able to work remote. Um, it's been uh, it's it's been quite a quite a quite a ride. Um, you know, I also think that uh, some of the new technologies have been pushed forward a lot faster. So so that change has happened a lot faster than I was expecting. Mm -hmm. Yeah. See, I I don't know I don't know from from our perspective, it's kind of interesting because. I don't know if I, if I can give out of this credit for us jumping into the virtualized workflow, if you will, or remote. Um, just nature of our business was not only we had to, prior to epidemic, think about connecting multiple jobs, uh, multiple offices, but also each of our job sites had to, prior to epidemic, function as a, as a remote office. So the infrastructure that was put in place was robust enough for us not to do any additional either purchasing or, or um, implementation. I mean, it requires testing the bandwidth, you know, upgrading some hardware and software or, you know, testing or stress testing, if you will, our ability to com communicate with 2,000 people at the same time because we had those stress tests. And, you know, the, the infrastructure surprisingly worked well. You know, WebEx and Zoom um, worked well. Uh, we noticed a slight move toward out of this cloud by small organizations that, for whatever reason, didn't manage to put the infrastructure in place prior to that. The only thing that I thought was kind of negative, and, and maybe that's just me being curmudgeon, was <laughs> that there all of a sudden there were so many parallel communication channels. I like what Giselle said, um, you know, everybody kind of learned how to work with teams, but then in conjunction with teams, there was still text, there was still email, there were Zoom messages, there was WebEx recording. So now it be, it's becoming almost really interesting to see how we're gonna consolidate it back and, and bring that communication and information exchange and things that are being captured in casual conversations back to maybe a centralized source. Mm -hmm. So it's nice to see that what Adolis put in place as a, as a revenue generating strategy worked really well under the epidemic stress, but I don't want to give too much credit to them in terms of stating that they invented the workflow in the cloud because with a little bit of investment prior to this, anybody could have uh, created that virtualized environment where people can mm -hmm. collaborate. So, you know, it, it's a wash from yeah. my perspective. So, so Thomas, you hit on something there. I, I think that's important. And, and obviously there was some discussion here uh, this morning about it as well. And, and that is of a common data environment, right? One singular place. Uh, to store everything, right? Um, and, you know, uh, with the ISO 19650 standards for data aggregation and standardization that come out from owners, um, or for owners, rather, from, from the ISO uh, uh, group, um, you know, today Autodesk announced um, Autodesk bills, quantify, and coordination, um, which are a little bit of a riff, I think, off of some of their existing uh, uh, tools and platforms. Um, but, you know, to your point there, Thomas, I, I think, you know, being able to capture one-off conversations, right, or, you know, water cooler conversations, right, um, that, that has been a problem even for ourselves, uh, right? you know, uh, 
And, and while Teams has, has certainly helped the communication and, and the fluidity by which we can communicate, um, of course, we still even, and, and we're a tech-driven company, we still have people that are adverse to that technology, right? And, and jumping on those things, right? Um, so with, with the announcement, really, of these new products from Autodesk, um, do you all see those kind of fitting into your existing workflows or augmenting your existing workflows? I certainly see um, Autodesk Quantify being being something that you know my former employer would take advantage of, um, being able to take that BIM data and, and either do two D takeoffs or or three D takeoffs. Um, I think is 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 extremely extremely helpful. I think uh, you know anything that aligns us to some sort of standard, um, whether it be nineteen you know. Uh, 350 or 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 another one that that allows us to share that data across uh, across platforms is huge um, because there's been a lot of a lot of the data I don't think is is properly structured so that it can move back and forth from one application to the other um, and it's really hindered um, quantity takeoffs um, if you're a serial builder builder it's probably pretty 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 straightforward, but if you're building one-offs, and, and most buildings, frankly, are one-offs, um, it, it's really hard to get all that data um, properly aligned, in my opinion. Absolutely. You know, I think we're all friends here, and we all have a kind of love-hate relationship with <laughs> Autodesk, and, you know, and, and, and it, it's, it's, it's sometimes too easy to blame Autodesk. It just kind of comes off as a knee-jerk reaction, because I would say I've Industry as a, as overall is dysfunctional um, in itself. Uh, I would I would just have a very cautious approach, and I would say the proof is in the pudding because you know every time when something has been announced, there was a certain period where that had to reach a certain level of maturity. I mean, you know, we are what now five years or four years after BIM 360 has been announced with. As Alexandria, and we are still troubleshooting and rewriting the code as as we are chatting here. So, you know, I I'd, I'd like to see it function and and go the stress test of all of us, and then provide a strong feedback. I think the best way we can we can serve this community is to to step up our engagement level with others. And, and not because I, I want them to be my best friend or because I want to get on their junket list or, or, or swag. It's really, it really makes a difference. I would, I, you know, over the last couple of years, we managed to get some insight and inner working. Not everything is always hunky-dory, but I think that current generation that is spearheading design and construction effort within Autodesk, I think they are really, really good listeners and they take it to heart. Not everything is easy, but it's a different breed of leaders that I think they're here to make a difference and probably constructive feedback is gonna help them. Absolutely. I did see actually in the AU site today that there are a, a ton of great opportunities for us to provide that feedback. Um, I forget exactly where it was on that site the discover more section uh, where you could take a look and, and try and participate in some of these focus groups uh, that Autodesk is hosting and, and, and really curating this feedback from, right? Um, so Richard Giselle, I, I just wanted to give you guys an opportunity to respond as well. I actually also wanted to open up that we did have a question that's floating in the chat as well. I don't know if we saw that. Um, there it is. But, I was going to pitch that out there uh, because I know uh, Inventor was definitely talked about a lot today um, and, and kind of pushing forward and back and not to get too far out of the general session because I know we're going to have a conversation about some of those things with manufacturing. Um, but I know somebody asked if uh, Revit to Inventor and back uh, was finally working and, and have we tested it and what are our thoughts. Um, and, and I know uh, Tomislav, I think we've had this question about two and a half years ago a couple times about what goes into the model and, and what doesn't. And um, I seem to remember it pretty, pretty clearly. So I um, want to throw that back to the group and um, throw in as well from, from our side that uh, 
yeah, it's great if we can get certain items to push from manufacturers to our Revit models and back and forth. Uh, but there can definitely be a point where it's too much or it's not necessary or it's not helpful. And so we have to be careful uh, about not doing everything just because we can do it as opposed to what actually helps the process. Right, right. Well, and I, and I think there's potentially two use cases and I'll let Jim and Giselle jump in here. Um, but, you know, um, in, in my mind, I, I see one scenario where a process piping manufacturer or designer has, has created a very detailed model of a chiller plant, for instance, right? And being able to transition that into Revit much faster or potentially in the push of a button um, could be significantly advantageous. But now when we, when we drill down into the component level, that's when I'll hand it off to the experts. Yeah. Um, well, it, it, let me just say that, you know, having been asked uh, within the past six months uh, uh, several times uh, about taking a, a, a mo something that was clearly modeled using 3D with very specific components and then ask the question, like, I'll give you an example of kind of like a, either a pallet uh, mechanical room or a mechanical room in a box, whatever you want to call it, uh, something with a combination of uh, uh, hydronic separators and uh, heat exchangers and, and the like. Um, if it, it, having those components flex parametrically uh, and yet maintain, you know, buildability and, and, and constructability um, uh, across the, the combination of different uh, different sizes, different requirements, uh, it, it becomes a very difficult task. Um, technologically speaking, we can handle it by the nesting of, of uh, column subcomponents and each one flexing according to the uh, loads so and selections that are being made. But, it, but at the end of the day, it becomes a very complicated uh, complicated issue, complicated process uh, in itself. There's a need for it. I, I'm not just not totally convinced that, Re that Revit is there yet for it. Yeah. Giselle, what do you think? Well, uh, when I see all the uh, newly launched products here, I can't help but think that uh, Maybe my previous employer might want to look into something like the Quantify, um, just because I've also been on the side of having to like do things in multiple platforms because they're not connected in any way. They're they're not um, like they're Autodesk, non Autodesk, that sort of thing. And so I've been there where I've had to launch products and have to do things in one platform versus another, that sort of thing. And one of them was a quantity takeoff software. So I guess that's kind of where my mind went, where uh, when these things were listed as like new tools. But, um, but yeah, I mean, that's, that's kind of where I'm at. I, I think that might be something interesting to learn more about um, in that sense. Um, just because I've been there having to do things in multiple platforms, just because they, they don't talk. So that, that's kind of where my mind went when I saw those things listed. For sure, for sure. No, it makes a lot of sense. And, so and speaking you know, of Quantify, oh, sorry, sorry. Ian. Uh, speaking no. of Quantify, I, I want to kind of pitch a quick question to, to John and Tomislav being more on the, the contracting side. Um, a conversation we've had repeatedly with contractors uh, involves a, um, we'll call it an ability to, trust, uh, to trust architecture models, right? So there's uh, there's architects that everybody's used to working with that their models are, are solid and fairly accurate, um, but contractors don't just work with one or even a couple of architects. They typically work with quite a few. So is a tool like Quantify valuable at all unless you're remaking the model yourself anyway, or do you see a time in the near future where you can use something like Quantify with an architect's model um, that's not from in-house, that you don't have to vet and model yourself. So, so Rich, I really love you, but I will never trust your model. I know. <laughs> <laughs> but but here, here is the question, and, and I, uh, you guys will pardon my ignorance. I, I missed the keynote, and even though I should have, but I was walking the job site and really freezing. Uh, is Quantify built on Forge, it's assembled. It's, it looks like assembled. I don't know that it is. I'm not is it, okay, that. so it, it looks, looks like, like assembled. It's still built on Forge because for, uh, I don't it wasn't so. built in Forge. I believe it is. So here is, you know, we, we use assemble, and to Rich's point, and uh, John, feel free to, to, to disagree or agree, is basically it really boils down how well the model is being put together. 
And then not only the way the model is being put together, but it's the metadata associated with the model. So, so all of the classification that speeds up our process, and that can, that can be anything from just coding of elements to putting entire sequence in the model, if you will, phasing, if that is done correctly, or work sets or whatnot, then we can start thinking about how do we approach different models by different architects if we can have some kind of consistency or commitment. And you know, if, if, if anybody wants to go and get a plenary or whatever the tool is uh, that is out there that will maybe spell out for you for you what you need to do, that's great. I'm just saying it still boils down to commitment of a user that generates the content to really put their heart and soul in it and say, okay, there's a downstream value. So, but we live in a world where architects are selling services, CMs are selling services, so time is money. So if I can cut a corner and not populate the data and say, all right, it's your problem, right. no quantifiable fix to that. So yeah, do you think it's a... I tend to I tend to think that um, you know there's a there's a a lot that's to be desired and I think it's going to take time um, to get there. I I think um, I think standards are are one way, education's another piece of it. Um, I think the software has got to got to make got to be somewhat easier to get it in get that data in there more natively. And then manufacturers um, start to populate that data in their content um, so that it's already embedded in there. So it doesn't need to be, you know, so to speak, hand jammed or, or typed in there. And then how do you how do you how do you automate all that so that so that you can get those those takeoffs? You're right, it's highly inconsistent right now, and right. And so I think the ISO standards help. Um, I think I think there's a, a general realization that that we've got to do do something better. Um, in the industry, um, it's important. We've all got to work together, and we've got to quit, you know, sending uh, sending incomplete data back and forth to each other. Uh, we ha we have an own responsibility to our our clients, as well as as the the folks that are going to inherit those data downstream as digital twin um, foundation. Um, we have to start collecting that data. Um, and we also have to start, we also have to understand that we're all in it together. We've got to work together to figure out this problem because it's not going to be one, it's not going to be one discipline or, or, or one architect that's going to solve it or, or one, you know, general contractor. It's going to be everyone collectively working to figure this out. Right, right. Absolutely. Now, now Jim and, and Giselle, if you all been listening to this, um, what I'd like to understand is from, from your perspective or from a manufacturer's perspective, um, you know, do you think that the buck kind of starts there and, and perhaps maybe that's why there, there aren't these data rich, as rich uh, or, or, or cleanly classified models as? Right. From, well, from an en engineering standpoint, we know that building systems is, is that your system is only strong as, a, as your piece of the weakest piece of content. Mm -hmm. So, and that, so that's kind of where, where we try to, you know, focus on the functionality for the for the for the user. Um, architecturally speaking, I, I don't know how much that uh, that is of a concern too, because it's not like connected systems. But I imagine, as far as being dimensionally accurate, having the proper metadata, having the proper resource, you know, where can you get it? How much does it cost? But you know, all of the the things that are going to going to follow through uh, through the life cycle of the building process, you know, those things all have to. Uh, uh, being uh, consideration, you know, it's um, it's uh, it, again it just I know having seen a lot of weak content out there that that there's there's a room for improvement, and I think that is essentially how we're going to, you know, John, when you talked about uh, you know who, who inherits the data, well, if the, if the data is crap, who cares? So it's uh, that's kind of where the. The, the focus needs to be. It needs to be if the focus is on the data and making sure that's all that is, uh, it's it's properly structured, properly organized, and contains everything you need. Then right, then there's a lot less of the cramming in the in the in the, in the cramming to fill in the, the blank spaces. So um, so can we round that whole thing out to say that quantify is 
for at least based on this group's perception, an invalid tool unless you're remodeling everything anyway. I don't want to push it that far. I would, yeah. Okay, that's I mean, that's, that's what I was that. asking. Like, are we like where are we at? In is is it still usable? Like, does it do something for us at that point? It, it is good. To, it, it is good to give you eighty percent of the insight in what you're receiving. Eighty percent is better than zero. Absolutely, eighty percent is better than zero, and sure. it points out where data falls short of promise to deliver. But then nobody will bank their profit margin on twenty percent unknown. Mm -hmm. So you still need to do your due diligence and engage the entire team. Okay. You know. That, that, that's my, but I'd really like to see if this is forge based or it's still old hoops. Right. By, um, assemble. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I, I think, I, I think it's, you know, it's, it's a good start. We're starting to have those conversations now, right? This is a good thing. I think it's aspirational. Mm -hmm. And I think that, you know, version two will probably only get better. Um, you know, and, and that's what I'm excited about is that we're having these conversations now um, and enlightening uh, clients um, to, to understand what it is that their end goal is. What do they want to track? Maybe it's embodied carbon. Maybe it's uh, daylight harvesting. Maybe it's, you know, how, how long has it been since I changed the filter on this pump? Um, you know, those, those harder questions and drilling down into what those things you want to track, you know, like Rich was saying, you know, you can collect all the data in the world, but if it, it's meaningless to the, the, the client, then it, it's all for naught, right? So, you know, having, the, having an owner that's engaged in understanding and, and willing to work with you um, to, to map those things out, what's important to them, I think is, is, is also just as helpful as, as the software that gets built around it, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah, absolutely. So we've got two questions here that have come in. Um, I'm going to try and wrap them a little bit in one here, um, but um, they're, they're kind of ecosystem questions, right? So how, how do we all see, um, or do we see quantity or quantify, excuse me, uh, replacing things like Bluebeam or some of the Trimble tools that are out there for QTO or Timberline? Um, you know, do we see those replace, do we see Quantify replacing those, right? Um, you know, or, or really what, what is the, the market differentiator of Quantify in your guys' mind? And the estimator is going to call. <laughs> yeah. That, 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 yeah. 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 Th those are the people that would be yeah. answering this question. I don't want to, mm -hmm. I don't want to invoke the wrath of an estimator. Right. Right. Yeah, maybe yeah. I've, I've tried it. Yeah, I, I mean, I've tried some of those tools, you know, and, and from what I saw, I mean, I'd love to stay within the ecosystem, right? I mean, the interesting thing is you have the partners, okay? So we all know, you know, Beck is a vested partner in mm -hmm. what AutoVest delivers. Sure. And they've been working on that estimating. Now, quantifying and estimating are two different things. Mm, very much so. So what, what Beck is offering is holistic approach to our, I use the tool to quantify them in the same tool I'm estimating. Mm -hmm. uh, in my view, out of this, either needs to support those partners or they need to come up with an estimating tool that is quantum leap in what other people are delivering. Right. This is just kind of, yeah, you know, you, I can tell you how many square feet of concrete I have, but how much is it going to cost me in this market or any other market? And what's the lead time and how much manpower I need to put it? Quantify cannot tell me that. Right. So it's, it's con this is convenient. Right, right. Not so, I mean, do you, we always kind of go back to that lowest common denominator, which is Excel, you know? And, and yeah, unfortunately. Right. And people are kind of moving from it. I mean, you can, you can tell that large construction companies, even though, yes, yeah, still there, there's still emphasis on, you know, internally common data environment, all mm -hmm. the, because people are more in, in, in love with 
analytics and sure. looking at legacy data and understanding how they were estimating jobs 10, 15 years ago or last year, sure. then crunching them quickly. Mm -hmm. So, absolutely. Okay. Yeah, it, it, I think it's a tough spot there. Um, and yes, yeah, so there there is a, a question here about, you know, quantity surveying in, in the UK and Australia is certainly very different um, than what we think of as, as QTO, right? Because their their QS there, um, right, they have many different stop gates uh, to quantify and to make sure that the project is on budget, right? Correct. So, you know, perhaps, and, and obviously this is all conjecture, right? Because we have not seen quantify other than uh, for a few minutes here this morning, right? Um, but if we kind of extrapolate that, I, I do think that as those models evolve, right? And, and, you know, I think another thing to consider here too could potentially be the contracting methodology, right? Um, if we're in a design assist type of a contract methodology, right, that model is going to evolve and perhaps could get to a point where, yes, at CD, for instance, we could extract that data and it could be fairly reliable, right? And maybe, maybe closer to 90%, right? As opposed to our 80% on a traditional design bid build. Well, I think it's safe to say that any any estimate is driven by quantity. Okay? Of course. The, so, you know, if, if, if I were to look at improving my product delivery, my project delivery, and, and quantify is indeed rebranded assemble or tweak, uh, you know, there, there are certain aspects of the tool that are very useful. Tracking changes over design development is extremely useful because if you and I agree on GMP at 50% DD, you know that if amount of drywall grows by 20% or your structural steel goes up 10%, that you are not holding your end of the bargain. So as, as, a, as, a, as a stop check or, or whatever, it's useful. I just don't want to make proclamations that it's, it's a quantum leap in how do we do estimate. Sure. Sure. Yeah. Well, it's garbage in, garbage out. It's only as good as, yeah. as the information that you have in there. Um, well, and, you know, I think at this point, let's let's jump into the ADC keynote. Um, and and let me just bring up here a. Uh, oh, I was not cooperating. Um, you know, I was really excited about several of the products and, and partnerships that were discussed here during um, the the secondary keynote or the second keynote here, and it is the AEC here. And I, I should say too that um, Giselle has done a fantastic job on uh, creating these mind map uh, visuals for us to kind of talk along to. Uh, and let me just make sure that it's sharing the right one. We'll share this. Yeah. All right. So that should be sharing now. Um, so, you know, one of the things that really got me going here this morning, and I actually have seen a, a press release about this yesterday. Um, was from a, a partnership between Autodesk and NVIDIA about a product called Omniverse. Um, and the whole premise of this is, is going to the full macro stage that you can, where we're effectively looking at cities, but all the way down to the product level, right? Um, and, and being able to interrogate that data and really add all that data that we've kind of been talking about for Quantify and, and things like that. Um, now we've seen, of course, we've seen these uh, uh, partnerships before, right? Um, you know, something that comes to my mind is uh, VREF, right? Um, sort of a competitor to Enscape, right? Kind of that, that real-time renderer. And um, it looked fantastic, right? Um, we tried to use it ourselves. Um, we had some challenges uh, implementing it and, and being able to utilize it. Um, but that aside, um, what do you all think about the, the Omniverse uh, uh, um, announcement? Mm -hmm. Bad things, I guess. <laughs> oh, okay. so, yeah. I haven't read it yet. <laughs> okay. Yeah, well, I mean, like, like if you think of an owner, right? Um, you know, we, were, we, could, we could talk about the GSA, we could talk about any owner that has multiple buildings or a campus. Right, and and if we think of that, right? Well, they have to have a way to visualize all of the product component pieces, right, or project component pieces, right, um, or some some of the you know uh, city type of projects, things like that, right? 
um, there needs to be some way to visualize all of those pieces together, right? Um, and be able to drill down into them, right? Now, we don't know yet what type of analytics come out of it, but the fact that being able to collaborate between Revit and AutoCAD or, or, or um, 3D Max or Maya, or perhaps any of the other products that they didn't talk about, right? Um, you know, if we think of the Teclas of the world and things like this, which um, actually leads me to another question, but um, I, I do think that there's a lot of viability in something like that to provide a, a really tangible digital twin. And I don't like to use that word because it's a super buzzword right now. <laughs> yeah, I'm surprised to hear, hear it being used uh, so much by Autodesk um, today. You know, I, I believe that digital twin is coming, you know, what that's going to look like. You know, I think, you know, the digital twin consortium is helping to navigate through that, um, which we're, we're members of. Um, and, and, and you know, what that's going to look like um, going forward. I think that there's a lot of compelling um, interest in it. Um, but graphically, you know, how do you how do you show all this data? Um, that's that is a that's a huge challenge, right? And show it in a way that's compelling. Um, you've got to create dashboards to show that information in ways that make sense. It's um, almost like the biggest issue is still the the user interface, right? Like it's it's not the fact that we can pull the data. That's that's obviously important, but um, the data doesn't do anything for us, and more importantly, the the client if it's not in a digestible way um, for them or their operations or whatever that data is informing, it, it doesn't do anybody any good if it's not easily digestible, right? And um, I know Ian and I have had some offline conversations about UI and, and dashboards and uh, trying to figure out ways that real-time data is important as well as aggregate data, right? It's, it's, it's two different things. It's uh, what decisions you make based on what's happening right now, and then what decisions you make quarterly or at the end of the year based on what's happened throughout. And those are two different things. And, and again, we haven't quite addressed those. Uh, we haven't addressed the fact that there's two different data sets that are both important, how those are delivered, and how they're digested. Yeah, one of the, one of the things that I saw during the um, AU theater, um, the gentleman's name was David Weir, he's with uh, Unreal Engines, and they showcased a, a number of items. I don't know if you guys got to see that or not. Um, one of the ones that I was particularly interested in was the uh, Cityscape Digital and then uh, 51 World. Yep. Um, the 51 World it was just, uh, it was beautiful, it's elegant. Um, in my opinion. Um, it, and what I'm excited about is, is the gamification of the data to represent it in a way that's more digestible and more easier to use by, by people don't maybe necessarily need nor under, need to understand. Um, sensor 121 is actually a, a fire alarm that's going off you know, and you can visually represent that in a building. It's almost like out of, you know, out of something out of a, a, a sci-fi movie with the way it can represent, you know, where it's at in that 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 spot in the building is, is very interesting and very compelling, I think. So, so I think those things are definitely compelling, um, but that's not new either. So mm -hmm. we're talking about things that Inkscape and Fusor and other software has been able to do for quite a while in this gamification of BIM data um, and allowing owners to walk through and kind of select an object and understand what it is, right? Um, that, that's not new. Uh, and not to kind of, you know, slam Autodesk for, for touting it. It's just the issue is not that the um, ability is new. The issue is how to get it from an architecture model, an AEC model, or an AE model, and get it into the client's hands and how few of clicks and how easily transitionable it is from point A to point B. And in the past, everybody's working on these one-click deliverables and it's getting better, um, but the issues with the specific uh, Unreal connection to Autodesk is the 
knowledge of the user to get it from a traditional Revit model to a client ready model is way more clicks than some other softwares can do it in for the exact same data and honestly a more realistic experience. So, so Rich, during this or, or anybody, this, this not, not only for Rich, for anybody on a call again, because I wasn't listening, I, I, I get a need for visualizing, representing data and, and sharing this across either multiple platforms or, or have a one common environment where data can be sliced and diced. But was there any mention today during the, this keynote about, all right, we are visualizing the data, but what are we really doing with it? Like, are we, are we introducing elements of predictive analytics? Are we, are we dissecting the data and, and providing tools within that visualization concept that allows us to understand and investigate trends? Are we doing any kind of quality analysis on data? Was there any, any, any mention of that? Or there was, was one, like, hey, there was yeah. one item that was mentioned that was geared towards simulation that I think would yeah. fit into that category. Yeah. Um, okay. It yeah. wasn't mentioned extensively at all, uh, but there was, there was a pretty intriguing uh, visual with the simulation and, and it almost looked like, actually they talked about uh, hospital beds and whether they were full enough, um, and, and actually having that as real-time data. And that was what John was talking about, that cityscape, right? Where they, they were trying to understand um, how many beds were empty and how to allocate resources for that. In that same conversation, they discussed simulation and taking that data in order to make decisions. Um, and they kind of flashed a dashboard. That was the only time that I saw, and you, you all can okay. absolutely yeah, uh, contradict I me, that, that goes towards that, Tomislav is is making actual moves based on the data. Yeah, actionable insights. That's Absolutely, a, that's, a, that's a key. Yeah, well, and there was a point in, and we're kind of jumping ahead, and that, that's okay. But um, there was a, a discussion in the Forge keynote as well. You know, talking about being able to interrogate all of the data that would be in this, you know, house CDE as, as docs, right? Um, and and I, I, you know, I joked to our group chat about something that I've been trying to do for many years, which is integrate, e easily integrate uh, IoT sensors and time series data into cross-sectional data, right? The, the type of data um, that we generate when we're designing a building or constructing a building. Um, you know, and, and of course, in, in the keynote, it, it seems as though, oh, it's just a push of a button, right? Well, no, not, no development ever like that, but it, it almost seemed as though they had, obviously they had listened, right, first of all, um, but it, 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 something else resonated and I can't remember exactly the wording, um, but it, it did seem as though they're almost reliant on us to not necessarily develop those solutions, but think of those solutions for them, right? And, and really communicate that back to them. You know, I did get that, that sense throughout a lot of these keynotes um, that, you know, they are open to that communication and they want to hear about it, right? Um, and, and to really evolve themselves as well. I, I know that I think that what you just said is really important and it's, it's, it's a challenge for everybody on this call or people that are listening. This is what I would say. I like when you said they rely on us. And here is my thinking. What Autodesk is providing right now is a commodity. <laughs> the cloud environment, the software, their widgets, its own commodity. Mm -hmm. What we have, whether it's on design end, consulting end, construction end, the service. we have experience, we have a know-how. We are still not at a point where we are effectively trading our know-how for their commodity. Because, you know, we, everybody on this call knows that we pay through the nose. And we pay through the nose for the opportunity to make out of this product better. And the way we are making it better is through us providing a know-how when others get us on a call and says, hey, wouldn't you be you know, willing to be exclusive member of a team that is telling us everything you know about <laughs> visualizing? So I think, I think it puts profession in a really interesting position. Now with an actionable insight and, and the validity of the actionable insight needs to be 
ingrained into what we know to really say, hey, Ara, that's great, but you give us what we need if we are telling you what you know and the price that makes that makes it palatable to us. Sure. So <clears throat> nobody feels it so it feels like a partnership versus extortionism. <laughs> great point. I hope you don't have other people on the call. I would agree on that. And actually, I'm you know I'm looking at the list of attendees here. I really wish one of my colleagues was here because um, about a couple months ago, one of my colleagues was on the BIM Thoughts podcast on facility management, and uh, I actually got a mind map on that. Oh my goodness! <laughs> For those of uh, keeping track at home, uh, so basically she talked about digital twins, and in a sense, she was saying it was wasted effort in, because she wanted all the information, but the thing is, she wanted to be able to manipulate data in different ways and uh -huh. look into how to share the data and work in different systems. So it was like, you got to talk to someone who's actually going to be using this or like finding it actually useful. So when I see this whole Autodesk tandem thing, I mean, I mean, I don't do exactly that right now. So it, you know, it sounds nice, but like someone who's in like facility management or someone who needs to like maintenance of buildings, this whole thing is said and done. Those are the people that need to be in the conversation to actually like say what they really need. So, I mean, products sound nice, but I mean, you really need someone who's like been there and done that to say like, I need this or I don't need this. That's just shiny and nice, Absolutely. but good. Yeah. <laughs> that's, that's spot on. I mean, I couldn't agree more. And just the fact that we spend probably four hours every week telling them what superintendent needs, on the product that superintendent is supposed to use three years after it's being launched, something's wrong. Right. Okay. Well, the product's yeah. not made by superintendents, right? It's also not uh, made by operations absolutely. people. It's right. not made by architects. It's not, you know, it's it's software developers. And I mean, they. that's why they're constantly asking us. I, I think Tomislav's point earlier was that they're listening a little bit more than maybe in the past. And that's a great thing. Um, that shows a lot of promise, but the, the team, I mean, software developers are not architects or contractors or engineers or operations people. You're exactly right, Rich. And, um, you know, that's, that's always the challenge, right? Is, is enough education to be dangerous, right? In, in that case, right? Um, and, and, you know, Giselle, I, I love that you brought up Tandem, and, and I kind of wish that they would have spent a little bit more time on it, um, because we saw they, they showed this, this area where, where you could kind of add parameters and properties, and it almost looked like you could manage those properties, right? Um, and, and it looked very interesting in that, in that sense, um, because of the lack of standardization, right? And I'm glad that the ISO... 19650 came out and, and evolved from, from where it was. Uh, it, uh, in my opinion, it has some ways to go, but it, it's a wonderful point to start at. Um, but what I wanted to ask here is, um, and, and this is kind of changing directions a bit from, from our, our previous conversation here. Um, there was a discussion about BIM Collaborate Pro and BIM Collaborate. Now, I got a little hazy on that explanation, and I'm, I'm hoping some of you can help me with this. Um, but BIM Collaborate Pro, is, from my notes here, uh, is going to be what BIM 360 design is now, and it will all be migrated to that, or those that have seeds of that. Uh, as well, uh, docs will be included in, you know, in that, as well as in the ADC collection, which I think is a fantastic thing. Um, but I was a little hazy on what BIM Collaborate was. Is that intended to be kind of the the freer version of it for our owners and our operators and, and, and people that just need to interrogate our models and, and documents? I, I don't think they elaborated much on it in the talk, um, but a, after we threw that note up earlier in our chat, Ian, I looked up an article on the difference and it was very hazy, to, it's to, amb ambiguous to say the least. It appears that your, your statement that the, the owners and um, consultants are taking BIM Collaborate license while the professionals who are paying for the AEC say, seats are getting BIM Collaborate Pro. 
So it gives us a user license that is not, you know, seats that we have to use um, for our everyday day-to-day -day use. Yeah, I kind of, I kind of, my takeaway on it was, was it was akin to Navisworks Manage versus Navisworks Freedom. Um, and the mm. collaborate was that free viewer that's going to, you know, allow people to participate or at least look at the model, um, which I think if, in my other circles would say has been a huge impediment for adoption of BIM 360 um, is, is requiring licenses for it. Um, you know, but I know it's also evolved too. So yeah, that was sort of my takeaway as well. Gotcha. Okay. Um, and, you know, there was a lot of discussion about automation, right? Really the, the three key pillars I think I got out of the AEC uh, keynote here today, and, and of course they hammered it into us. And, and we've talked about two of the three here. We've talked about data and we've talked about insight. Um, but we really haven't touched on, on the automation side of things, right? Um, they showed this wonderful platform called SpaceMaker. Um, and, and Rich, you and I had a, a quick side conversation about this. Um, it, it seems really great in terms of architectural generative design, in terms of being able to I quickly identify perhaps tenant bases, um, and, and, and of course there's, there's many more things that it can do, um, but you know, I'm, I'm still, I'm waiting for, and of course I'm more MEP minded, so I'm waiting for that side of can we quickly design our HVAC systems or our piping systems, right? With, with a minimal amount of inputs, right? Of course it needs to be checked. Everything needs to be checked, right? Uh, you, you can never trust a software to do 100% of correct work, right? Um, but what did you all think of, of SpaceMaker or of, of some of the other automation uh, tools that were discussed? So we, we looked into um, testfit.io, which was literally founded by uh, someone who was basically in a dorm bedroom um, and came up with his own version of generative design for test fits uh, and was actually at Autodesk last year. Like he, he actually achieved some success. Um, and it effectively is what Autodesk has turned into a more native solution with their generative design. And there's, there's a lot more to it than that. That's very reductive. Um, but the reality is on the, on the architecture side, so many people have looked at it from trying to determine unit counts on a site and things like that. Um, how many offices I can get in a building. And in reality, what they touched on and in my opinion, didn't highlight near enough um, was dealing with things like COVID. So um, without getting down that rabbit hole way too much today, they talked about putting in a new parameter about six foot distance, right? And um, to reorganize a design, a building, a layout, anything like that, and say, hey, if we change this parameter and you go from a building that we're designing for X people and we have another instance where we need to quarantine social distance X, Y, Z, and we need to separate everybody by six feet, what does that do to the layout? What does that do to the number of employees? What does that do uh, and, and into our, our travel? Is it possible to walk down hallways without coming into contact with each other? All of these things are very, very big deals right now that they kind of skimmed over, and I thought that was odd. Um, so, so test fit, absolutely. Uh, we we want to use AI tools instead of, you know, uh, sketching, and our version is in, in Revit now, obviously, instead of on paper, but still sketching iteration after iteration to deter determine number of desks or number of units, that is absolutely beneficial. But even beyond that, it's what is changing one parameter do to the entire design, and is it, is it still successful um, in that sense is highly important right now. Mm -hmm. So, Rich, are yeah. you doing that fit? I really, I really thought uh, the acquisition of SpaceMaker is kind of a game changer. I like TestFit as well. Um, you know, they're really good. I think at the beginning of a of a project where you're looking at those, you know, sort of massing and trying to figure out what the optimal design is on the site. Uh, the one of the things that I, I felt was was gone over really quick. Uh, was the uh, grading op optimization yep. uh, within InfraWorks. That's huge. That's something that's traditionally been, a, a, in my opinion, a royal pain in the butt to, to, to site a building um, 
you know, and have, have that grading proper. Um, there are issues all the time with this and how, how to best optimize that. And, and, and at least what they showed, you know, being able to drag that stuff up and down and, and just move it around a little bit was really compelling to me, you know. Um, so I think, you know, the generative design for, for COVID-19, that's, that, that's great. That's huge. You know, that, that should be, we should be seeing more of those types of things as time goes on with generative design, right? So, so John and Rich, I'm just uh, curious, are you guys both using TestFit IO? Not now. Uh, what, what's the wording? <laughs> I mean, um, it, it was a little clunky. Um, it, it was very, very innovative for its time, especially for the price point. Um, but with all of the people who have since tried to replicate it, there's a lot cleaner versions. Yes. Honestly, the generative design native to Revit um, that was released earlier this year, we've got a pilot project uh, in the works probably in the next month or two. Um, that we're going to run their generative design on and run it fully through and, and kind of compare it apples to apples to somebody coming up with a similar solution as they would from, you know, a traditional design sense and make sure that it's doing everything we need it to and accounting for what we need it to. Um, but the, the general consensus is there's other tools that are cleaner and a little bit easier to use now. Yeah, my, my, my issue is I've been... For a year, I've been paying for test fit mm -hmm. for planners to use it because they wanted it and nobody touched it. <laughs> and I, yeah. it, it's hard for me to evaluate unless I dive into it. So I'm just trying to solicit some experience that you guys might be willing to share. Yeah, uh, yeah of course. Because I know as soon as I pull a plug on it, they'll complain that I don't have it. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, I honestly haven't had a chance to try it out. I've seen some of the demos on it and it seemed compelling. Um, you know, I'm, I'm interested in Space Maker, um, you know, conceptually, it seems like it, it can do a lot as well. So, yeah. What, what do you all think about Pipe? You know, that was another uh, uh, acquisition from earlier this year, and, and they did talk about it a little bit in terms of data, or, or data extraction, right, from our different platforms. Um, did you guys catch that or did, was it just kind of, it was a quick mention. Yeah, I, I know it, almost nothing about it, so I, I can't speak to it much. It's an amazing product. Yeah, I, we love it. The, the, people that it, the, the people that I know that have used it absolutely love it and, and rave about it. Um, and uh, it, it, it sounds like it's a pretty amazing product. I haven't personally had a chance to use it. I've met with some of the team members that, that from Pipe. Um, and uh, never really got a chance to use it, but some of the some of the folks uh, on the team have gotten a chance to use it. And they had the same same feedback. It, it was wonderful. I wouldn't wouldn't do another project closeout without it. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, very humble team, by the way. Uh, extremely humble and knowledgeable. And so that's a, that's almost a good selling point, if you yeah, will. Yeah. Yeah. But uh, you know, the the natural language processing engine. I mean, there's not a single flake of spec on the design bit build job that doesn't get ingested, digested by pipe because the way it breaks down, we, we, we did a study, basically what would take two weeks for a project engineer in terms of understanding the spec and generating a submittal log mm -hmm. is boiled down to our one hour, two hours of somebody's time. Oh, wow. The deck itself, and then we really want to understand better the handover because even even today we were discussing about you know what happens at the, at the, with, with the data at the end of the cycle. Mm -hmm. And I think, in my view, Pipe is being coveted by Autodesk as the handover, ultimate handover tool, mm -hmm. because they already have a handover module. Sure. And I think next iteration kind of ingest all those operations. And everything from BIM 360 yeah. in order to be sorted out, processed, and given to client. The only question is, what is the format that okay. will be handed over to client? Is it going to be a hook to get them into BIM 360 or you have a self-contained 
Right. Or portable. Right. Environment. Would it be IFC four? Right. Which they did talk about today. Right. You know, which which would yeah. be fantastic. Right. Interoperable to majority of platforms. Right. Um, could be. I, th well, I think of uh, up to it. You know, all the images, everything that's in four. Of course, there's so much. Right. Could be a three. Right. Could be an Amazon bucket. Right. Sorry, yeah. John. I, I look at it as uh, being something that might might fit well in with Tandem. I'm just guessing, but yeah, absolutely, absolutely. You know, and and we'll honestly, you know, in in my view, right, and and this is just where I've been sitting recently is, is with the owners, is that if if Tandem and Ops got together, right, to be able to manage the assets, the work orders. Uh, the schedules, perhaps even the spaces eventually in ops, right? But but pulling or aggregating all of that data from that CDE, i.e. tandem, right? Um, and again, I'd love to see more about it, right? Um, but from a from a aggregated and, and federated uh, property set, right? But being able to extract that out, oh, that would be that that would make owners' lives almost as easy as a push of a button, almost. So anyway, uh, let's talk about DFMA, right? It's been a, been a buzzword for a little while now. And John, you and I have talked about it. And Rich, you and I have talked about it as well. Um, out of the things that were talked about here today um, and, and, you know, furthering the industrialized construction, right? Um, what, what stood out to you as, as, you know, moving that ball down the field? Well, for me, I, I guess, you know, I noticed some of this stuff was kind of skimmed over a bit more. Um, there was like an article that went out saying, um, you know, don't miss these keynotes is what it's going to be about. And the whole Bryden Wood thing, um, it seemed like it was really skimmed over. Cause, but I thought it was really interesting, though. Um, I actually went to their website to like figure out what this whole uh, DFMA and like what they were doing with that. Like they were taking like this, this manufacturing benefits and having it happen on site um, and it was reducing uh, carbon it was lowering uh, the amount of labor involved I mean it looked like a really interesting thing I mean they even have like a whole scale of adoption of what you could do for uh, having component build versus the traditional build like a whole scale and for some reason it seemed like it was skimmed over in these uh, keynotes so um, I got additional mind maps on that but um, that's what I took away from it. I, I thought that was really interesting. I wish it would have been talked about a little bit more, but um, I found it on their website. Yeah, I definitely wish it had been talked about a little bit more as well. There was, I'm trying to remember which, uh, which uh, keynote it was on, but they did talk about the fact that um, really a lot of um, modular uh, assemblies and, and things like that are, are happening as smaller assemblies, sort of kit aparts. Um, that are being, you know, um, coordinated with with various disciplines and, and shipped out, you know, palletized um, to be put in place uh, as making up most of um, most of the offsite manufacturing that's happening um, at this point, which was kind of surprising because there's a lot of there's a lot of focus on um, you know modular design for for hotels and and you know hospitals and things like that where really data centers and, and, and other buildings are, are, are being assembled almost in the same way, only in smaller parts, um, and, then, and then just trucked in on site. And, you know, coming from the construction side, I used to see that all the time. And it was always humbling to see, you know, these components, these models, these branded, you know, BIM objects and, and, and content all coming together into actual um, physical pipe out in the field and, and assemblies that are just being pulled in and, and bolted up and, and into place, you know, um, it's, it's truly humbling, you know, when you're only working in the virtual world to go out there and see it in, in, in the flesh. Um, so I'm really excited about what, what DFMA can bring. Yeah, well, and that's one of those things, John, that, that gets me excited about working in this industry almost every day is that going from computer to a job walk, like you were saying, Thomas Lund, today, I mean, I, I still get giddy every time I get on a job site because it's like, oh, I've already seen this in the virtual world, right? You know, um, and, and I, I just absolutely love it. And the idea that we can get to that 
physical built environment even faster, right? With the FMA or industrial uh, construction or, or whatever we want to call it, you know, tomorrow, right? Because guaranteed there'll be another acronym or, or buzzword for them. Um, and and I do I do hope that um, it takes on more of a life of its own, right? Um, un unfortunately, in, in my experiences with it, um, it's got to start so early on, right? That it's almost prohibitive by the time that you get into sometimes DD, sometimes CD, right? Um, you know, people will tell you, oh, you can't really do it. And you could, right? Sometimes it's cost prohibitive. But that's one area of automation that I would love to see, or, or perhaps even some machine learning thrown out to say, okay, well, what are our, what are our DFMA options? You know, even in CD, right? Let's say, oh, okay, maybe it wasn't a priority, but it becomes one, right? You know, and, and how can we extract or break down our models in such a way that it's able to be built off-site, right? And that, that, to me, that seems like a kind of a natural progression of being able to identify these portions of our models, right? Um, so I, I, think, I think that's a great place to, to jump into kind of our, our next area, our next um, uh, keynote. Um, let me jump over here. We'll bring up, we've got another great mind map here from Giselle. Um, and the next keynote was the design and manufacturing uh, keynote, and I believe that's it. Okay. And so, of course, we've already talked about the Revit to Inventor uh, collaboration and, and, and integration there. Um, you know, one of, the, one of the great through themes that I saw, obviously, was this common data environment, right? Working together, sharing all of this information. Um, I unfortunately did miss some of this keynote. Um, so, you know, one of the things that really interests me, though, on, on the product design side of things, at least, is really the, the generative design, right? And I like to think about, at least, are we able to learn from the product generative design side and implement that into architectural or MEP side of things? As I mentioned before, that's the part that really gets me going, right? So, I think one of the... I would Go say ahead. the answer is yes. You know, I, I think that you absolutely could. I don't I don't necessarily think that it will be nearly as, shall I say, sexy as as product design. Um, but I think I think at the end of the day, you're taking a lot of complex problems and being able to distill those down into some some different design options for an architect to make a decision on or to further refine that design is is impactful and all that much faster in getting to the conclusion that you're looking for, right? I don't know, maybe Rich, you've got some thoughts. I, I think they repeatedly said some things that we'll, we'll touch on for half a second and say that Autodesk spent 15 to 20% of the time that they were talking about generative design in the AAC industry, trying to convince people it wasn't gonna take jobs. I don't know if anyone else noticed that. But every time they mentioned AI and generative design, they said, this isn't going to take your job and here's how. Um, and it's, it's, it's so interesting that people um, are kind of freaked out about that. Uh, and they alluded to the car and, and where that changed jobs, right? It took some, added others. Uh, the internet completely changed uh, how we work today. AI is going to completely change how we work. It's the exact same thing. Technology innovation always changes jobs. It takes some away, it adds others. That's what happens. Um, but for some reason, we're extra concerned when we use the term robots or AI. And I think it's interesting because as a designer, as, as a person in the AEC industry, AI allows us to do things faster so that we can concentrate on the stuff we should be concentrating on. As designers, we don't need to take the time to do 60 iterations to figure out the best way to fit in uh, X number of 800 square foot units and X number of 1200 square foot units. We should be spending that time on the human scale and interaction and other things that have to do with envelope and the exterior of the building that have a huge impact on people when there's a tool that allows us to do those things like they mentioned, that's just iterative. You know, designers didn't become architects because they want to check 
15 iterations on how many units you can get into an apartment building. And I, I think it's to, not to jump on the soapbox any more than I already have, but this is exactly what people want when they go to school to become architects is get out of the iteration and get into the design aspects. And uh, that's probably the most promising thing we're seeing with generative design from Autodesk and, and from others. But to, to talk about these specific uh, keynotes today is let's not spend all our time that's supposed to be designing on iteration and fitting the puzzle pieces together because there's a lot more time we could spend on impacting the human condition and experience and all of these other things that honestly architects are supposed to be doing and we don't end up getting to because we're too busy doing iteration. Sure. So Rich, how are you going to react if, if AI actually takes over the design process? Not iteration, not, not basically deductive problem solving, but the actual design process. I, so, I, I heard everything but the first like six words you said. Oh, sorry. What are you, how are you going to react when AI takes the actual design process? So, uh, so design's a couple things, uh, but one of those is intuition and emotion. And AI is, I don't see AI taking emotion into account anytime soon. Um, we, we've compared things like AI created art to something like a Jackson Pollock, right? Um, and that's been a discussion for a long time, which is how is art computed by AI? An AI computer can recreate a Rembrandt um, in a totally different setting and still invoke a similar emotion. I'm not saying we'll never get there. I'm saying we're a lot farther from AI taking over design mm -hmm. than we are from AI taking over iteration. Mm -hmm. You would, I would, I would be, I would be cautious there. That's all, because I think I think that's one of the biggest perils that we are facing. That goes beyond architecture. I don't think this is this is you know that peril is only in the domain of architectural design. I think one of the big biggest perils we are we are facing is probably you know uncontrolled proliferation of AI, and I don't want to sound like a lot of it, but there are, there are people that are way smarter than I am discussing that and really looking into that as a problem. Um, well, it's, it's kind of a philosophical problem. Yeah, right. It's, it's, it's not an AU problem, it's not out of this problem. <laughs> I don't think it's our problem today, but I wouldn't dismiss it necessarily. Mm -hmm. I, I think there's a valid statement to it in product design already. I mean, when we looked at some of the bicycles that were created that they showcased today and some of the stuff Decathlon was talking about, um, I don't think it's a huge jump to any other design industry. So I think we're already a at a point where people are relying on AI and ignoring intuition um, or, or ignoring the human condition of design. Um, mm -hmm. Yeah, it's a philosophical problem at, the, at its root, right? Right. I guess I would, the way I would look at it is it really gives you the opportunity to now spend the quality time that you wanted to on the design to begin with and really start to look at those, you know, those, those interactions and those adjacencies and, and how does it really actually benefit, you know, the occupants of the building um, in a more fundamental way, and you can explore those design options. I, mean, I, I suppose at some point, maybe the technology will get to a point where it'll, you know, spit it all out, and we won't even need in, anyone to do it. I guess, but uh, yeah. I, I'm, 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 I'm enlightened to think that humans are not going to allow that happen at some point. I, we'll just continue to invent ourselves as being relevant in the in the process. I, I think, um, and I don't want to elongate this specific point too long, but I think we're still at the level where designers have to help identify the problem. And until we don't need designers to identify the problem, we won't ever be able to have AI provide every solution when we can't successfully identify the problem. But it could identify the problem, Rich. In theory, right. at like, some point, we were talking about, right? Yeah. So we, we were talking about data, right? Daniel, make 
And, and so we were, we were talking about data and, and how to make sure that it's federated and, and correct, right? Well, we can create a framework by saying, okay, pipe or similar learned uh, data pool, look at this data and tell me what is wrong, what is right, things like that, right? Um, and again, I don't think that that's too far of a stretch from taking it from figuring out the optimal sun positioning for an open office. No, absolutely. Things that are like that that are objective, like sun positioning, absolutely. But things that are subjective, when you sit down and talk to a client and try to understand what their day-to-day -day relationships and activities are, what's important to them that they don't know is important to them is something that AI can't dissect unless we get to a point where so many other people have determined priorities that we're just transitioning one person's priorities to another person. That point. Hey, Giselle, I have a question for you regarding the mind map that you captured. Did anybody talk about potential conversion of Vault as a platform, PLM platform and common data environment as Docs? Uh, well, when I, when I was listening to this whole thing, what I heard of Vault being talked about is that uh, since everyone's being really distributed and everything, they're using Vault as a mobile device so they can do ECOs and stuff through that. There's also some sort of Vault Connect, which I see I didn't add anything else after that, but I think that was like another platform where people could look at something, like some sort of insights with that. Otherwise, that's, that's mostly I've seen with Vault in that uh -huh. uh, keynote. It's kind of interesting because, you know, if, if they are really talking about the conversion of manufacturing and construction, you would, you would really think that 20 years plus of experience with Vault would actually translate one way or another toward docs. And we've seen some previews in terms of standardization. Yeah. Um, it, it's, well, weren't they supposed to shut docs or Vault down? But that's... Did, did that maybe change because of COVID, I think? I don't know. Because I think... Uh, they, I they, 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 they mentioned, you know, having almost, you know, 1.5 billion documents in Vault. Yeah. So, you know, I, I heard the same thing Giselle, you know, mentioned, you know, Vault Mobile and Vault Connect. So they seem to be providing some sort of lifeline to it to continue it on. Uh, it doesn't sound like it's going away. Yeah. Which yeah. is good. I mean, uh, like you say, I mean, you get that many documents in there. I mean, you're, you're, it's not a flip of a switch to move them in, into docs, right? No. I mean, there are night and day differences in terms of platform UI. And, and even if you get down to the administrator level of, of you know, creating projects and, and managing the roles, right? They're, they're completely yeah, different. Yeah, Walt, Walt has entire gatekeeper process mm -hmm. that was put in place that is still to be implemented on, on a docs end. Yeah. Right. And, and did anybody talk about partnering uh, with, you know, last year they talked a lot about Manufacton as, as mm. spin off uh, from ex RLS people. Was that in a play today? Did anybody mention it? I didn't, I didn't hear anything about Manufacton. Huh. Did, did you guys? No, I didn't hear that. Even, even during the Forge keynote, right? Because they sit on Forge. Yeah. You know, I, it, it, it's very interesting. I, I heard actually very little about uh, a design to fabrication tools and platforms yeah, and things I like think, that. I think, I think the Golden Child in Chicago is not doing well. I think the shutdown, the, what I heard today is the shutdown of the production line. Oh. Skender. Oh. Hmm. So, wow. Well, yeah, yeah, I would do it. You said Sorry, yeah. 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 So, okay, well, let's. Let's jump in. I think we've got one more um, mind map here from Giselle, and let's let's bring that up too. Uh, that should be the Forge keynote. Yes, this one got me got me going here today uh, for sure. Let's see here. Uh, this should be this one. Okay. Yes. Wonderful. Okay. So. Um, now, obviously, we already kind of talked about here how, you know, Autodesk kind of suggested or hinted at, you know, that they want to hear the solutions from us. But, of course, they've, they've created and they have certainly added to the microservices that are available uh, in Forge, right? Um, 
you know, and, and I think they talked about a couple of different things here. And I'm just reading through kind of your your mind map, so I can point to some of these here. Um, of course, they talked about Toshiba, which was a really great one on the elevator side of things, right? Being able to configure um, highly complex elevator assemblies, right, directly from the design automation um, and, and the uh, large model viewer, right, um, was a really cool example. You know, one of the things that stood out to me, too, was a, um, a Forge API for manufacturing, which I, I thought was fantastic to dive into um, more of the product configurators, even though um, you know, the design automation API has already been sort of used for that. Um, you know, one of the other things, uh, there it is, it, that really stood out to me was, was Bamboo. And what this is, is they've created almost a soup to nut um, product here that, that takes a raw product and creates wall panels and, and super strong framing out of bamboo almost immediately. Um, you know, what, what did you all think of that? You know, Rich, from, a, from an architect's perspective, you know, uh, would, would you design with, with bamboo so that, you know, if, if it were readily available, here's the side. So um, to jump back to that whole recovering carpenter side, um, <laughs> there, there's... Uh, attributes of bamboo that make it very, very difficult to work with um, on the building scale. And part of that is its hardness, uh, fastening to it, assembling it, things like that. Uh, if, if anyone's ever tried to put in a floor made of bamboo, uh, you can't use traditional nail staples or nail guns. It's too hard. And so um, there's factors like that that I'm really curious. I'd love to sit down with a company like that and understand how they deal with those things. Um, it's, it doesn't have the same properties of traditional wood. So how does that change the entire construction? Um, what does that do when you don't have studs to things like blocking, um, to things like you know drywall? Uh, so they were talking about effectively removing the necessary studs from everything but window openings. And um, I, I'm, absolutely interested to kind of sit down and understand the implications of something like that to all of the other construction elements that go into a typical building. Yeah, I mean, I mean to add on to what Rich was saying, I mean, when, when you start to experience a new product like that, just like, you know, uh, we experienced when we were doing a CLT building, um, it required a whole different mindset and that and that if you're going to scale that out to the industry, you've got to train folks on how to actually interact with this material and how to, how to work with it in the most efficient way. Because in some ways, um, you may be gaining some efficiencies or, or, or some other things out of using that product. But if you haven't trained the team the right way, they could be installing it incorrectly and it has to be ripped out and redone, things like that. Um, or they just don't know how to work with it. They don't have the right tools. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And I sound like the 80 year old guy in the room when I say new, new things don't work uh, the way people think they do. And I not at all meant uh, to approach it from that direction. But uh, the reality is, I I'm very curious to see how they overcome some of those hurdles. Because as soon as he pitched what it was, um, I had about 20 different issues that I thought would come up from a typical GC uh, or carpenter or, you know, a handful of tradespeople working with a system like that. So I'm just very interested to see how they dealt with that or if they told everyone else, you know, you're going to work within our system. Like, have they, have they evaluated the system to work within the industry or have they tried to force the rest of the industry to work with them? Because as John said, that's a much harder task. Oh, absolutely. Absolutely. And I'm all for sustainable materials. Right? Uh, absolutely. Uh, ultra hard sustainable materials. Um, and, and I agree with you that it, it is going to be a challenge to, to try and get a lot of people in there, um, just like different composite woods and, and things like that, right? Um, did anyone catch in this keynote, they were talking about, and my note said here, forge simplification were the words that they used, right? Now, you know, Forge being built on microservices, right, being able to access different parts of data, right, relatively easy or, um, you know, different automated tools, right? But what it made me think of 
were some of the low code or even no code tools that are out there today, right? Like like Dynamo, for instance, right? When we when we talk about connecting into Reddit, right? Um, but it almost seemed as though they were hinting at a Dynamo for Forge. Did anyone else pick that up? I know there was a viewer they talked about, like a viewer for visualizing the stuff that I think they were talking about, like once you did all that work, like how would you be able to understand what's happening with it at a higher level? So I have that noted. Otherwise, I, I that's kind of what I caught at most. Okay, okay. Yeah, because to me, that's putting, that's giving us as practitioners, right? Modelers, architects, engineers, uh, contractors, that's giving us the keys to the car. If we can build quick add-ins that meet our workflow today, right, or, or augment our workflow better, right, by, by using these tools, right, and leveraging, uh, uh, you know, docs and BIM 360, right, um, it kind of seems logical, right? Obviously, it's easier said than done to create something as, you know, simplistic uh, or, or usability-wise as simplistic as, as a Dynamo for Forge, right? Um, but I kind of I kind of picked up some hints there and, and and seemed very interesting. And of course, they were talking about uh, or, or, or the next comment uh, did roll right into using the viewer and connecting different IoT devices with Azure or or AWS, right? Um, and and that's where again some of that analytics, some of that insight came into play too. Um, but but perhaps Forge, you know, I don't I don't want to make this blanket statement, but perhaps part of Forge becomes effectively a Power BI version of, of Autodesk where we can interrogate and create the visual dashboards, um, both with the model, right, which everybody wants to see a, a, a beautiful model in the large model viewer, um, as, as well as that data that's connected to it, right? Because we want to be able to click on that cross-sectional data, right? We want to see who the manufacturer is. We want to know if we have to order another motor, that we can get to that motor and, and where that O&M or, or OEM information is very quickly, right? So I mean there were a couple of recent recent workshops that they gave. Was it? Where they were implying that that data visualization and I think Liam worked on it. Oh. Where it actually happens in Forge. Oh. So it's a connect it's you know it's still a JavaScript connection and sure. but it's it's there that was almost two or three months ago, the oh. that we had. Okay. But one thing that caught my attention during the Toshiba presentation, I, I just maybe glanced for 25 seconds today. I've seen point cloud visualization in Forge. Mm -hmm. I still didn't see that to date. Mm -hmm. Is that a new feature or I mean, maybe I'm missing the whole point? Well, one of the things that they, I think they just slid in a little under the radar was a newer, um, uh, object file, and I think it was, I want to say it was OBJ. They said it very quickly, right? Really? Um, but there's a new visualization file, whereas before it was an SVF, right? A, a, a riff on an SVG type of a file where it houses all the points in it. Um, but what I, what I remember hearing is that that file type allows massive com uh, uh, compression. Compression. Yeah. So potentially, yeah, because that that to me that's one of the shortcomings of Forge. I mean, mm -hmm. and and I, and I know that a large model viewer allows for point cloud visualization because there are spin-offs sure. of large model viewer. But I don't know, I'm missing. But I don't think Forge allows for point cloud visualization within the current platform. I, I mean, certainly not with the the native. Yeah, I mean, you you yeah. you upload point clouds to docs. No matter what you upload, it's mm -hmm. just file exchange. Right. And right. and that has been that has been the problem mm. for for us. Oh absolutely. So if they are moving making move in, move, move in that direction, that I would welcome that. Well for sure. And and so obviously you guys use point clouds on most every project, right? Pretty much. Yeah. So what what's been your go to solution on that? Uh, same two. Same two is okay. Good. You you've seen it. Yeah, it's fantastic. It's a go to solution for us. Um, but, you know, again, that boils down to, goodness gracious, how many different point solutions we have to juggle in order to get it right. Right. Absolutely. Yeah. 
So, okay. Um, let's see what else did, did stand out here. Um, you know, obviously there was a lot of great things that were talked about here. And I think, you know, the biggest takeaway for me is, is going to be, you know, what, what can we do, right? And, oh, I like, I did like this quote here that, that you captured, uh, Giselle is the, the new digital craftsman, right? You know, kind of, you know, Rich, to your point, you know, kind of moving from, you know, working with your hands and, and timber as a, as a uh, carpenter to working with JavaScript and Node.js to, to generate these new tools, right, and things like that. Because, you know, if we, if we think there has to be, and, and maybe this is where part of Pipe and, and some of these other AI slash ML solutions will come into play, perhaps they do get integrated into Forge and we can leverage those learning algorithms, right, to train different data sets, right? Um, and I, I, I'm excited about it, to be honest with you guys. Uh, I, I can't wait for that kind of stuff to come. Yeah, I think there's a lot, of, a lot of potential out there and a lot of really good things that are, are now happening. You know, much to Thomas's point, you know, I think that there is a lot of, a lot of listening that's going on now within Autodesk. Um, and so I, I, I can't think um, that that's not, a, that's not a bad thing. That's a good thing, right? And so I'm, I'm excited about the way some of these connections will be made in the short term as well as the long term to, to make life a lot easier for, for us as the, the digital craftsmen. And, and I think um, there should be a note to say that in, in addition to the Autodesk listening, there should be, and, and I think honestly is, a lot more listening happening among the A&E industries from fabricators and tradespeople and contractors as a whole uh, working together to provide documents that we know are actually going to be the solution they're implementing on site. Um, there, there was a lot of frustration for a long time on both the A&E side, the whole design side of what was drawn versus what was built. Um, and, and a lot of times those issues came up because what was drawn either wasn't feasible or wasn't economical. And I think there's a lot more conversations happening about balancing those things, um, feasibility, economical, as well as design intent. And I think that has to happen at our level uh, as well. So I think, yes, I think Autodesk is listening. Um, and I think we, as the design side, have to and should and, and, and are, but should continue to listen more. I would agree with that because um, what I've seen from all these keynotes, there's like this very common theme and it's all about bridging gaps, skills gaps, uh, just interoperability, open, that sort of thing. Um, I mean, I, I think we do need to listen to each other and see a lot of different perspectives. Um, back in January of this year, I actually took a Twitter poll and I asked like how many times uh, someone has been, like, how many times have you been on a job site or manufacturing shop floor, that sort of thing? And out of 64 votes in the poll, 79.7%, uh, uh, that was, they answered saying they lost track so many times, but 20.3%, uh, they were out in the field less than 10 times. So that means that there's uh, a gap in understanding of, like, how things go together. There's uh, just a gap in, like, like what other people are going through, like on site versus in design. I mean, I've, I've taken lots of quotes for it. I don't want to go too far into it, but I mean, I took a poll on this because I was curious, like, like you need to talk, you need to see what the other perspectives are. You need to learn like how these things go together. I mean, people talk all the time about getting people involved like earlier on, but like you kind of need it like throughout. I mean, getting designers on site to learn how things go together, getting, uh, I've even seen in, in other cases here to say like get a superintendent into the design uh, office to see like how those processes go together. I mean, it, a lot of these things that like, I gathered was just, you know, everyone just really learned a lot from talking to each other, being on site, seeing what the other side was. And my favorite quote from like the entire thing that I got from this whole thing was, Regardless of anything successful I might have done recently, they are still the best years of my professional life, like being on site and stuff. So I think that's really going to help tie all these things together. It's, it's all about the, connecting these, these gaps, 
you know, uh, the interoperability of things, getting people to talk and, and have it truly mean that we're in this together. Absolutely. In the restaurant industry, we called it cross training. And it was, yep. uh, you know, when, when servers were, were first to work in the back of the house, when um, sous chefs were forced to be a server for tonight to understand what the other side um, went through. And uh, I worked at um, some, of the, some of the higher end restaurants in Southwest Missouri where every chef but the head chef uh, was forced to be to run dish uh, for at least one night during training to understand what it was like to be in that scenario. It's a position you'll never be in, but to, to be better prepared and to better facilitate the work as a team. And I think that absolutely computes to the AAC industry. We, we have to be willing to listen. And, you know, honestly, I wish there was a little more mandatory work for everyone to work on both sides of the fence because there truly is uh, no better understanding than have to walk in someone else's shoes. And um, I, I think the best we can do aside from that is to listen to each other. Couldn't agree more. Yeah. So, all right, with that, I thank all of our panelists. I thank you all for hanging in there and taking the time and, and watching all these keynotes today and providing some great uh, insights. And Giselle, thank you again for these great uh, mind maps. Uh, I think they really helped facilitate our, our conversation here today. Um, as I mentioned in the beginning, we'll be uh, posting this recording up to our social medias and our YouTube channel as well. Um, so thanks again, and I wish everyone a great rest of AU. I, I hope we jump into some great classes um, and, and really learn a lot. Thanks for having me. Yeah. Good meeting Thank you, you everyone. Thank you. Very Thank you. much enjoyed it. Cheers. Cheers. Cheers.